You know, I, although my memory is a little bit foggy, I can remember myself as a teenager. I was kind of boy crazy and just distracted by things like my appearance and confused about things like, what in the world am I going to do with my life and where should I go to college and where should I, you know, am I going to get married and who am I going to marry and all those things and, and just the kindness of the Lord to reveal himself to us as teenagers or as children. And I, you know, I was, as I was praying for you all earlier this, um, I don't remember when it was, but I was praying for you guys and I kind of got reminded of this, um, this story about when I was 19 and I felt like it's even a little picture of what's happening to some of you this weekend. So when I was 19, I was a part of the ramp. Now, I didn't think that I would be you know, I, I thought I would go to um, a, a big university and study international development and then go serve a third world country. And, and when I was 17, my dad kind of threw out this idea. I remember one day I was in the kitchen and you know how you, like as a teenager, you get like those spontaneous like hijacks from your parents where they throw out advice and you're just trying to like dodge it and get out of the way and run. So I was just, you know, in the kitchen trying to get my snack and dad comes in and he's just like, hey, he's like, I got a thought. Do you ever, do you have parents like that? They they start a conversation, you start to kind of like sweat and tremble and be like, how long is this going to be? So I'm standing there and my dad's like, hey, I just had this thought, you know, what if you, what if you moved to Hamilton when you got done with high school? And of course, because it's dad, it's an automatic, no dad, that's a dumb idea, right? Well, I didn't say that, or at least I don't know about you, but for me, it's like, as a teenager, it was like an automatic no to anything that my parents said. And there's no logic behind it. It's just kind of, I don't know, how do you even explain that? So when I told my dad, I didn't say no dad, no way. I said, dad, (laughs) dad, I already have a plan. And I said, Gabriel would have to show up in my room and tell me to go to Hamilton, Alabama before I went to Hamilton, Alabama. And anyway, a few months later, a few different prophetic words, a few, you know, sometimes parents say something and it's kind of like sticky. It's like you can't get it off your memory and your mind, even though you don't want it to be there. And so I'm praying about what to do and this thought that dad said just keeps popping up and we're kind of like, oh, you know, I don't want to do that, Lord. And anyway, I don't know why I didn't want to do it because I love the people in Hamilton. I had known um, Miss Karen my whole life. I had known Lauren and Lindsay my whole life and I loved them. It was like an ego thing. I had a plan and don't mess with Stacy's plan because, oh, she's a 17 year old brilliant planner. (laughs) Anyway, a few months later, I came and I uh, packed my bags and the Lord had just, the way that he, I don't know, the story that he weaves with our lives of just simply following him. And anyway, I was, I was uh, 19 years old. I was sitting on the front row. I see this guitar player come in with Eddie James band and this, my friend Chad sitting right beside me and I just lean over to Chad and I'm like, Chad, I'm going to marry, I'm going to marry somebody like that. And Joe had dreadlocks and was just really focused on his guitar. And, and Chad was like, what? No. And I was like, yeah. And then that was it. And then a couple, you know, a year or two later, we were married. But it had to, uh, <laughs> but it, it took a village. It took a village. And Joe was so focused, like he was focused on, you know, going to Berkeley and doing guitar. And, and I liked him. But I had to recruit a little bit of help. I had to get, like, Bobby, his friend, who was also on the band, and Sam, his friend, and I was like, okay, I like Joe. Who does he like? And like, help me figure this out. Is there hope? Is there potential? So, you know, Bobby goes one day and reads Joe's journal and then reports back to me. And then Sam sits down and Sam has a heart to heart and like, what are you doing, Joe? This girl likes you. And finally, Joe's like, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'll be interested in her. And so Joe proposed, and now I joke, and he, um, I say, I chose you to be my husband. <laughs> I flipped the script a little bit, and I was like, no, I chose you. And he's like, well, I proposed. No, I was, I was, I was maneuvering all along. And anyway, I felt reminded of that story because I feel like some of you this weekend, you're here, and God has got his friends just saying, hey, God is into you. God has affection for you. 
and you're focused on your career and you've got great plans to be a rock star and but the creator of the universe he's chosen you and this weekend it's like you're waking up to that like man if god if he wants something to do with my life then I will, I will open my heart to being able to receive his love for me. And your whole life, right? Every bit about how you're gonna do this whole thing of following Jesus and walking in purity, walking in freedom, it's just you're going to simply respond to his love for you. He initiates and you respond. He calls you answer. Jesus told the disciples, I chose you. He chose you. And some of you used to have such a hard time even believing that. I know I did. And that's because we're thinking so worldly about ourselves. We still think kind of like, like Jesse when um, he had all of his sons pulled out before Samuel. We're still thinking just on mere appearance. And you've disqualified, you're just so shocked that God would want to fill you, that he would have a purpose, because all of the way that you value yourself is just based on these very temporary earthly measurements. And listen to what, what the Lord says to Samuel in 1 Samuel 7, or in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And this, honestly, this simple, almost seemingly shallow revelation was such a game changer for me when I was a young person and thinking about God wanting something to do with my life because as a teenager it was like everything revolved around how that I how I looked who my friends were did I have a boyfriend could I do sports and I couldn't and was I really good at grades and I wasn't and it was like I, I just didn't you know it was hard to understand how do I fit that God would choose me and other people have had that problem too. And this is what the Lord said to Samuel. He says, don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. But listen, this is the phrase that you just need to meditate on. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God is seeing your heart for him. And you may think, well, it's not even that big of a heart and there's not even much passion in there. How am I going to live my whole life responding to the love of God? How am I going to live the rest of my life walking in purity? And maybe you feel overwhelmed by some of these things. Here's the key that Jesus gave us. You're going you're gonna to do this one day at a time. Today... If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, he's going to give you the bread of his presence to sustain you. Today, his mercy is new. Today, the Holy Spirit is in you, leading you. How are you going to figure out where to go to school and what to do for your tomorrow? You're going to seek God today. Say today. Jesus said, Stacy, tomorrow is too much for you. It takes humility to receive that, right? Jesus said, you've got to steward these little things well. And then you'll be able to steward the big things. How do you live your whole life where you can be faithful to Jesus? How do you have this whole life that goes from glory to glory and strength to strength? Today, you live your life for Jesus. Today, you choose him. Today, when you stumble, you get back up. Today, before the sun goes down, you deal with the anger in your heart. On you can do this because he is with you in this today. And he chose you for this. You've been chosen by God and there's such significance on your life. He's chosen you to bear fruit, to be his representative, to be his conduit, his vessel, power. So no matter what the challenges are for you, 
going back home, going back. Today I feel like he is imparting strength and courage for this journey that you have ahead of you. Strength and courage so that when you, that in this day you can receive, even what Jacob just said, well, how am I going to make it all day? Just in this moment, receive from the Lord. In this moment, listen for his voice. Some of you are already worried about, well, how am I going to stay awake past midnight? (laughs) Just awake right now in this moment, receiving from him. He's very clear about this. Matthew 6, 34. So don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. Luke 16, 10. If you are faithful in little things, say little things. You will be faithful in large ones. If you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. He's given you grace for what you need today to seek him and follow him. And this really encouraged me because right, you can get overwhelmed sometimes with all the decisions. How many of you have big decisions to make even this year? Raise your hand. Yeah, and then how many of you, you're like wondering, you feel like maybe you need to know now. Well, even though you're only 14, you don't really need to know this, but you're overwhelmed with this thought, or at least I was. Well, am I going to get married? What's his name? I remember going into my quiet time and just being like, Lord, tell me his name. And, And finally, I just finally got this like revelation. Well, like, actually, the Lord, sometimes we get, as a pastor now, I'll tell you this little funny side, but I have people in church come and tell me, the Lord told me I was going to marry this person. And there's like three people that have all heard the same person. (laughs) And I don't tell them that, but I just say, I say, why does the Lord need to tell you who you're going to marry? Like beforehand, trust him today. Trust him today. There's a, there's a great verse that just kind of liberated my heart where um, the Lord's talking through Israel. I think it might be in the book of Ezekiel or Isaiah where he says, how does, he's talking to Israel, he says, how do you know if a prophetic word is from me or if it's a false prophetic word? And then the Lord replies, he says, the prophecy I give you comes to pass. (laughs) And if it's a false prophet, it won't come to pass. (laughs) So if God has said it, he will do it, right? And how are we going to steward prophetic words? We're going to follow Jesus today. We're going to be obedient to him today. Today, if I hear his voice, I'm not going to harden my heart and turn the other way. Today, I'm going to feast on the bread of his presence. Today, I'm not going to let anger give a foothold to the enemy. I'm going to deal with my anger before the sun goes down. Today, I'm going to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done. I'm going to steward this little bit of 24 hours. And I'm going to trust him for the epic story of my life and the story of eternity that he's weaving through it. You can do this. You were made for this. But Jesus was not, he was not presenting to his disciples just the good things and the good gifts. He was also preparing them for their tomorrow. And they were prepared for their tomorrow by listening to him each day. So he starts to tell them some of this some of the kind of distressing things that were going to happen to them and to him. He's preparing them. He's saying they're going to throw you out of the synagogue. The world will hate you. You'll stand before kings, but don't worry. I'm going to give you the words to say. And he's preparing them so that when he says, when these things happen, you will believe. So there are some things that you've heard us talk about that maybe feel even a little bit distant from your now, where maybe we're talking about suffering and the cross and your life feels pretty easy peasy right now so you're like what are they talking about hardship but we're preparing you because jesus said that the broad way is easy peasy but the narrow road is difficult and what are these difficulties he says in this world you will have trial and sorrow but take heart i've overcome the world so as I was praying for you all, there were two 
things that came to my mind that I was like, okay, Lord, if I was speaking to them, trying to prepare them for some of the hardships on the narrow road so that when it happens, they're not discouraged and they don't throw in the towel and think they can't do it, but they know, no, they told me about this so I can walk through this. It'd be two things. First, it's the pain of sometimes when you follow Jesus, you're gonna stand alone. But this is the beautiful thing about anything that you suffer as you follow Jesus, is that he has also had to stand alone when he walked on earth. He told his disciples right after they confessed their belief, he's like, do you finally believe? And then he's like, well, all of you are about to be scattered and I'm gonna stand alone, but I don't stand alone because the Father stands with me. So there will be times, and this is, this is, this is so, like, you know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, right? Even the great prophets, they would feel alone, and God would have to open their eyes and show them, you're not alone. This is why when Jesus appeared in the Old Testament through the different prophetic words, and he would come and he would say to people over and over, don't be afraid, I am here. I am with you. So listen to some of these passages. Get them in your heart so you're not alarmed, so that you don't buy into the lie that just because you don't have friends that you can't do this. The Lord will give you who you need when you need them. He's so faithful to do that. Paul was a man who was doing the will of God. I think everybody would agree, right? When we look at Paul's life, we're like, wow, I mean, you've got Jesus, and then you've got Paul, pretty much. And uh, Paul was doing the will of God. He was single, he wasn't married. And in this particular passage in 2 Timothy 4, 16, he's talking, he's kind of wrapping up this book, and he's talking about this, this um, having to stand trial. It was a really hard time in his life. He had been through a lot of persecution, the Jews constantly, uh, the people that he was ministering to, whatever city he would go to, whatever nation he would go to, he said there would be opportunity, and then there's opposition. It's like there's a wide open door for opportunity, but there's opposition. People are trying to kill me. He's going to stand trial. And so we're picking up in that story, and he says, at my first defense, no one stood by me. Everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word, that um, the word and the Gentiles might hear it. There will be times when you feel alone, but you're not alone. God is standing there with you. And he can be trusted. And then the next few verses, it's, he's asking for so-and-so to come and bring even the people that he said didn't stand with them, he was later reconnected to. So it's like this beautiful storyline of forgiveness and God giving us when we, who we need when we need it. But sometimes we need the people crutch to be kicked and we need to be able to stand firm in the sufficiency of Christ. That he is enough. So you can do this even when you feel alone. You are not the first to serve Jesus and feel alone. All right, so you have to deal with sometimes the people pain of feeling alone, even being understood, misunderstood. How many of you have tried to do something good to help people bring a little light into the darkness and it just backfires in your face and you're like, man, I'm never doing that again. A lot, of that, a lot of times that happens, especially when you get to be an adult. You'll start some ministry, and some people will misunderstand you. They may even hurt you, and you withdraw, and you say, I'm never, getting, I'm never doing that again. Count me out of the church. Count me out of the ministry. That was too painful. You don't know it's supposed to be painful. It's that process that we were talking about yesterday. It's bringing something new out of something old that needs to be shed away. You'll be misunderstood. I mean, listen to what they said about Paul. 2 Corinthians 10, 10, for some say, Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in person he is weak and his speeches are worthless. 
ouch. Aren't you glad Paul didn't stop when he got that feedback? <laughs> Even Jesus coming to save humanity was accused of working for the devil. Ouch. Even Jesus, the people he came to save, turned their back and looked the other way. So sometimes we'll be misunderstood and sometimes we'll stand alone, but God is still with us and he still anointed you to do the work of the ministry. You may go back to school, you may tell you know, your friends, you know, because God likes to be talked about and you're trying to be a witness and you may share something that God did for you and they may not react at all. That's okay, just today. Keep following him. Keep seizing those opportunities to talk about him. And that light within you that, that produces good deeds, it'll keep shining and he'll keep getting glory. So you keep on even when you feel like no one is standing with you. And then the second, second potential tension point in your relationship with God, you know, because relationships... They kind of have ups and downs, right? Like sometimes your best friends are just, you are vibing and resonating and then sometimes you don't understand each other at all and you're a bit upset at each other and you're wondering, are we even friends? Sometimes your relationship with God will be a little bit like that. There'll be seasons where you're like, God, you and I are so in sync right now. Everything you've done, I had it in a prophetic dream and we are just vibing. And then there'll be other seasons where you're like, God, you didn't tell me about any of this. And none of this makes sense. In fact, I could easily misunderstand you for being very, very bad, not good right now. So this potential tension point in this marriage that you're in with God, it's the potential tension of misunderstanding. And every relationship is founded on trust. Your relationship, this was in the testimony, some of the testimonies that you heard yesterday, where the enemy uses feelings, but everything with God is faith. What do we mean by that? It means that we are, we are developing this relationship where we are knowing the heart of God, the character of God that does not change. So when seasons change, and feelings change, and our life changes, we have this rooted knowledge of him. His character is good, and his love endures forever. All right, so to illustrate this, I wanna show you a little picture. Now, God is good, and he gives really unique gifts. So before I show you this picture, we're living in Manchester. I really wanted a dog. And we didn't have a dog, and we couldn't really afford a dog, because dogs are expensive. Um, so, you know, I was just like kind of praying about it, and I was like, well, whatever. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to get a dog, so, so be it. Well, then, guys, somebody moves um, houses in our neighborhood, and, and she wants me to watch her dog for her. So for the past year and a half, I've been watching this little sausage dog named Lola, who is so well-behaved. I don't have to pay for anything. The owner pays for everything. She's already been trained. She's like the best behaved dog. So God is full of really unique gifts, right? He's like giving me free dogs, but yet we don't have a building. And you're like, God, what is going on? So I want to show you this picture of Lola. There she is. Isn't she adorable? She's a very long sausage dog. So her legs are really short, but her body is very long. And Lola, and I, this is one of the things about Lola, is as great as she is, as sweet as she is, and she's, she's smart, like if you get the right treats, she can really listen and be obedient and stuff, but her understanding is limited, right? So Lola um, has to go to, the, I have to take Lola to the vet She's never been to the vet before because like, she's got this stinky, itchy ear thing happening. So I take her to the vet, and um, let me show you the next picture. I take her to the vet, and as soon as she smells the vet, she starts like doing the dog shake, the anxiety shake, right? How many of you know that? Where like the whole dog starts to like, because they're so scared and they can smell trouble, trouble. So she's shaking, 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 and I have to then, you know, give her um, like eardrops every day. 
And so the first day that Joe and I give her the eardrops in her ears, she is just like traumatized. <laughs> She runs up after, first we have to kind of like kung fu wrestle her and like put these drops in. She like looks up and, and, and seriously, the expression, it's like she would not even look at me for the next hour. She just like side-eyed me. Like she would, she was running away and then she was just kind of not looking me in the eye because there's no way in her understanding that that is ever going to seem good. Going to the vet, it's never gonna feel good to Lola. But it is good, right? Eardrops in the ear, she's always gonna hate it. She's never gonna be able to comprehend. It's never gonna, there's never gonna be, even if she gets used to it, she's still, her little understanding, it's never gonna be like, thank you for that. That was so good for me. My ears were itching and infected and there was bacteria. And if you hadn't gotten that antibiotic, it's way over her head. And this is the problem that we have with God is there's an understanding gap. There's a perspective difference. And he's going to lead you places. He told his disciple John. You were young, you did what you wanted, you dressed, but when you're old, you're gonna stretch out your arms and you're gonna go somewhere you don't wanna go. And sometimes Jesus takes us to places where it's like Lola in the vet. It's like there's nothing in our natural ability that's gonna be able to understand that this is good. And that's where you have to make the choice to trust in the character of God above the circumstances you're in. And there's even things about your own life, your physical makeup maybe, your limitations, the life you've had that you've not been able to control, that's painful and impossible to understand. And you're not the first person to have that problem. Listen, in Isaiah 45, the people of God had been through a really hard time. They'd been in captivity, they'd been oppressed by enemies, it felt like God had deserted them. And in the middle of that conversation, the Lord says, Isaiah 45, 11, <clears throat> Do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the work of my hands? I am the one who made the earth and created people to live on it. With my hands, I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. And then even when you look at Job's life, right? At the end of Job's life, when God finally answers him, he starts it with, where were you when I created the heavens? And he goes through all the things that he had done that are just simply beyond a human's understanding. And in this understanding gap, just like when I talk about the difference between Lola's understanding of good and my understanding as good, you get it, right? I mean, most of you have pets. It's like, oh yeah, there's no way. She's not even designed to have that level of comprehension. The creator didn't even create and wire her little brain to be able to understand antibiotics and doctors and things like that. That will always cause her to tremble. But you understand, right, that my intention is love and goodness. And that that antibiotic, it only lasted seven days. <laughs> Come on, there are painful seasons. And you've got to think, Lola was only on those antibiotics for seven days. Like that, you're soon gonna shift and all the suffering will give way to eternal glory. And what you see now in part, you'll see with perfection and clarity that everything he did truly was working for your good. He's a God that is for you, not against you. In closing, I just want to share, in your own walk with him, the seasons and the circumstances will change. You will sometimes stand alone 
and sometimes be surrounded by people who are for you and helping you and sometimes you'll understand what God is doing because you're sharp and you're prophetic and other times you'll feel like a kid just lost in the park looking for their mom. (laughs) But God is still with you and he's still good. So what's your part? If God's not changing, if he's good and you're just gonna follow him today, You're taking this little day, this little tiny bit of yourself today with these little, the little bit of money and talents and you're stewarding that today. What do you, what do you have that cannot change as everything is changing? I want to give you just in closing a few things that no matter what the season is going to help you respond to the love of God day by day. Okay. You ready to write these down? I'm going to breeze through them. Seven constants for you. Whether you're in university and you're going for your degree, whether you're engaged, whether you're single, whether you're married, whatever, there are some things that just like your human body, no matter what season, you still sleep, you still eat, right? You still interact with people. There are things in your world that you do to stay alive. They help you be who you are. And these things, the first one, no matter the season, whether it's busy, whether you're getting God or you're not getting God, you're going to just commit to pray. You're not going to be overwhelmed with being the world's greatest prayer person and writing books on prayer. You're just going to pray today. You don't ever have to have a podcast on it. You just pray today. He wants to hear your voice. When you're praying to him, this is what set my heart free. When I'm lifting my voice to him, he's not listening to me and thinking, oh, I wish she sounded a little bit more like Karen Wheaton when she prayed. Or man, if she, she's a little more James and a little less Stacy, then maybe when, he, when I'm praying, he's bending down to listen. He wants to hear your voice in prayer. He's not up there with scorecards thinking, oh, that person, I really like that. Give him a 10 in passion. Well, today she's only a one in passion. You have nothing to prove. You have one person to please. When you pray, you are feasting on the bread of his presence. Charles Spurgeon said not to pray because you do not feel fit to pray is like saying, I will not take medicine because I am too ill. You do, you approach prayer like Hebrews 4 says. Hebrews 4, 16, you come before the throne of our gracious God and you receive mercy and you find help in your time of need. Come on, sometimes when we get like, we get geared up and we, it's easy to fall into these ditches, right? Where we're, we're trying to follow Jesus. And if we get too much in this intercessory, prophesy, missions, change nations, we can be overwhelmed because really prayer is about us coming to receive his mercy and find his help. You receive his mercy. You receive the goods from God. You're not bringing the goods to God. You receive the goods from him, and then you distribute it to the crowds and the multitudes. But you bring yourself to prayer, and you just talk honestly. And if you can't focus, you write it down. And if you fall asleep, sweet dreams. Tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll pray again. If you miss the morning, there's noon and nighttime. If you miss morning, noon, and nighttime, you say your prayer at night, you wake up the next morning, there's new mercy. Come on, the righteous fall many times, but what do they do? They get up. What distinguishes you is not that you don't stumble, it's that you keep bouncing up. You've got the buoyancy of hope in you. You're like a beach ball under the water. You can't stay down for too long because there's a Holy Ghost in you. You keep bobbing up. You keep getting back up. So you're gonna pray. And you're not gonna aim to be the most awesome, powerful person in prayer. You're gonna talk to your father like a child talking to their dad, like a friend talking to their friend. 
And then the next thing you're going to learn to do is you're going to fast. Every season of life, in some form or fashion, you're going to pray and you're going to fast. Now, it looks different in different seasons. What is fasting? You're abstaining from earthly pleasure to feast on heavenly things. You're saying no to food so you can focus. You humble yourself in fasting. You abstain from something so you can focus in on God. Now, our youth group, when I was growing up, used to have this um, thing where on Wednesdays we would try to fast something, and then we'd come together to pray for an hour before service. And I remember telling my mom, I was in high school, and I was like, Mom, I'm going to fast today. I'm going to fast lunch. You know, my mom's like, Stacy, I mean, my mom's a praying, fasting woman herself, but I'm her daughter, and she was afraid I was going to get hungry. So she was like, take these saltine crackers, okay? I'm like, Mom, I'm not going to need to eat. I can fast for one meal, you know, because, of course, Mom said it. It was an obvious no. (laughs) So I go to school. I got the saltine crackers because Mom wanted me. And then lunchtime comes, and I feel like I'm going to die. So I'm overwhelmed with hunger, and I just start eating the saltine crackers in my car, and I'm just like, Lord, this stinks. <laughs> and it's this little revelation that, Stacy, you're not defined by your sacrifice. You're defined by my sacrifice. And this isn't about perfection. This is about pursuit. Another time I felt the Lord saying to fast, and this was when I was older and we had toddlers and I had to fix like three meals a day. And it felt like all I did was change diapers and fix food for people. And I felt like the Lord was saying, I want you to fast. I felt it. Now, what do I mean? But how do I know it? It's a sticky thought. It comes and you can't shake it. You try to shake it. Oh, that was just me trying to be religious, you know, trying to prove myself. But as much as you pray and as much as you wait in the presence of God, it's like a permanent sticky sticky note right on your forehead. So I think, okay, fine. I'm going to try this. I'm going to fast. I'm going to do this seven-day fast. I'm still doing like smoothies and things. But come the middle of the day, after all these meals of fixing food for other people, I just... I give in, I'm overwhelmed, and I just give in, and I don't know, I'm eating tortilla chips and whatever random thing is in the fridge, right? And so I'm eating, and then I just feel terrible. And I'm like, Lord, there's no hope for me, is there? Am I going to make it to heaven, God? He says, Stacy, you don't have to prove yourself to me. He said, grace makes it possible but not easy, get back on the fast. And your life is filled with the grace of God. But the grace of God doesn't mean that you don't hunger when you're fasting. And it doesn't mean that you're on this consecration, but you're, you're not fighting sometimes desires and appetites. It means grace is there to help you get back on the fast. And you pick yourself up and you keep doing it. And what is it? It's this outward expression of this inner hunger for God. So whatever season you are called to respond to that grace of God in prayer, in fasting, in giving. I know this is shocking, but even as a little person with a little bit of income, you've got to start releasing that to the Lord. Because one of the idols of the land is money. And when we give, it frees our heart from that idolatry. Obedience frees our heart. And these things, prayer, fasting, giving, come on, these are supernatural things. They're things Jesus taught us that when you start doing them, things aren't just happening in the natural. Things are moving on the inside. So prayer, fasting, giving, coming together with other people so you can be encouraged. Come on, you you commit. You leave from this place and you commit to go to church for the rest of your life. Many people will fall away. There's nothing new under the sun. Jesus said it. Paul said it. People are going to think that they, they are the church and they don't have to go to the church. Come on, you need encouragement. Don't be so arrogant that you think that you don't need encouragement, that you don't need to sit and hear somebody say something to you instead of always being the one to prophesy and do the teaching. You're going to come together. You're going to commit to the people of God because your heart can't be tender towards God but hard towards his people. 
you have one heart and you're not soft towards God, but hard towards people. So you stay in the presence of community to keep your heart tender to both. And then the last few, you're gonna worship, you're gonna learn to sing. I like to think in your own, I'm not a worship leader, not a songwriter, but singing is for saints, not just creatives. Singing is like an elevator. Sometimes in your quiet time, your prayer will feel like you're trying to climb Mount Everest with just your hands. But then you can do what Paul said, and you start to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and it's like you're getting in an elevator ascending Mount Everest. Come on, because you were made to sing, not because you're a great vocalist, but because you're the redeemed of the Lord. Because he saved you and put a new song, a new sound in your mouth. And if you think singing is just for vocalists, then you're shortchanging. Your tool belt is a bit short. Singing is a tool that helps you ascend Mount God. And then the last two, hearing his word and doing his word. You just commit to reading this. What do you read? Whatever you want. Read John, read, look on, the, look on the internet for a Bible reading plan and you just commit. And this is like, when you read God's word, it's like in the morning, you're reading his word and it's like you're putting oil all over your body. And then you're gonna go out into the world and the world is just gonna try to label you. But those labels don't stick to oil. Those oils, those labels about who you are and who God is, come on, you've been oiled up. They fall off, they can't stick. But when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit at lunchtime, come on, it can't shake off because you are in His Word and His Word is in you. You've got to oil up with the Word of God. It's like you when you come to church and you're in these corporate settings. Outside, it's cold, it's frosty, it's lukewarm out there. Your heart can become hard. Jesus even said it, your love can grow cold. But when you keep positioning yourself in the word, in his presence, in his body, you're like that fallow ground, just sitting under a downpour. How does the hard ground soften? The rain just keeps pounding. You just stay there in his presence and you keep doing these things. Your expression for him and you're gonna live every day, one day at a time with that tender, responsive heart. I'm gonna ask the band to come and we're going to just wrap this up. Paul said in Ephesians, I pray that you would understand the incredibly great power for those who believe in him. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That power is with you tonight at 11 p.m. when you're going to bed and you don't know what to think or maybe you're having a mind battle, that power is there, that power is in you to help you. We're gonna be talking about that throughout the rest of the day because today, it's a day of you receiving strength and courage for the mission field that you're called to engage with. Let's stand to our feet quietly. What I want to do to close is just all over this room, I want you to close your eyes. And like I said at the first of this thing, the story about Joe and I and kind of getting that revelation, oh, he likes me. Okay, well, I'm all in. Some of you are there where you Feel God initiating something in you this weekend. You've had a glimpse of his love, a little bit of revelation, a little bit more revelation that he's pursuing you, that he's chosen you.
And every service we've had this time where you are outwardly expressing your inner response to that. So this morning what I want to do is I want to ask you, as you're walking with the Lord, three things that I want you to just say yes to in this moment. And because the Holy Spirit is your helper, I believe it will be a sticky moment for you. Is when you are standing alone, I will stand for you, Jesus. That's the first thing. I will stand with you, Lord, even if I stand alone. And the second thing, Lord, is I will follow you even when I do not understand what you are doing or where we are going. I will stand with you, Lord Jesus. Just keep your eyes, bow your head, close your eyes. I will follow you, Lord, when I don't know what you're doing or where we're going. I'm going to trust your character. And in fact, I'm just pause right there. And if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand up all over the room. Now just repeat this prayer. Say, Lord, I'm here today to receive the help of Holy Spirit. By your grace, God, I will stand with you. Even if I stand alone, I will follow you, Jesus. Even if I don't understand where we're going. And I commit to do this one day at a time. So here's my yes today, Lord. Thank you for strength and courage today, Lord. Hallelujah. And as the band just leads us and sings, I want you to just start utilizing that that sound, that song. You sing to the Lord. You let a song express what has just happened in this inner, this little act of faith sometimes. It's just you singing something out, something on the inside gets out of you and it's an act of faith. And God meets you at that point of faith. 